Welcome everyone as you are coming in. Welcome everyone as you are coming in near and far directly on the Zoom on our webinar platform. Um, we are amazingly excited about all of the people that are on. We're gonna take just a few minutes and Carly's gonna give us some instructions of how we proceed. Why you so pissed? All right, I'm all set, Sharon. Um, should I go ahead? Yes, I think we should get started and you can tell us how we're all interacting with one another this morning. Wonderful. Well, good morning and welcome to the Emory and Henry 2021 MLK Celebration keynote address titled Good Trouble, Rosa Parks and the Radical Roots of the Montgomery Bus Boycott with Dr. Danielle McGuire. My name is Carly Blaylock. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with everyone before we get started. First of all, if you don't mind to keep yourselves muted, um, there will be time for questions and answers at the end, but while Dr. McGuire is presenting, if we can stay muted to decrease background noise and distractions, that would be wonderful. If you would like to be in speaker view, you can do that by uh, going to the top right-hand corner of your screen and selecting speaker view. That will allow the majority of your screen to be our speaker. Um, also, for our faculty that are present, we are hosting faculty connections after this event on this same link. So what you will do is just simply stay on, we'll play some music and allow our students to depart for lunch, and you will stay on for the faculty connections with Dr. Danielle McGuire. Now it is my honor to introduce the president of Emory and Henry College, Dr. John Wells, to bring greetings. Well, good morning. We are very happy that uh, everyone is here and we are excited about our uh, MLK week. We've already had some tremendous um, programming and uh, we're looking forward to a week of really uh, exploring uh, more of the ramifications of a life of social justice. So um, welcome everyone and uh, we're looking forward to our speaker. Thanks so much for being here. We will continue our celebration by hearing from our Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, John Holloway. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and greetings to uh, our students, staff, faculty, trustees, alumni, community members, and friends of the college. On behalf of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, it is truly my honor to present to you the 12th annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Convocation. As many of you know, each year this event is dedicated to the memory, life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Through the convocation, the college honors MLK with invited special guests to deliver a talk or performance around civil rights. As well, we continue to showcase our wonderful faculty, staff, and students throughout the week in the offering of workshops and different activities. I hope everyone is looking forward to a dynamic talk this morning. Our keynote author and historian, Dr. Daniel McGuire, a distinguished lecturer, is engaging, insightful, and we are fortunate to have her join us. The DEI team had the chance to visit with her via Zoom a few weeks ago. We are all excited for her talk. We have an incredible week of impactful programming and activities, which is the outcome of focused work 
by our very devoted MLK Planning Committee, a committee of faculty, staff, and students under the leadership of the Reverend Sharon Bowers, Director of the Inclusion and Dialogue Center, and Carly Blaylock, our Special Projects Coordinator. Can we please offer a virtual round of applause for our MLK Planning Committee? Thank you. Four years ago this January, I began my career here at Emory and Henry College, and I had the pleasure of delivering our keynote address. At that time, following the presidential election, my talk focused on how divided we were as a nation and the need for us to work together. I guess I had hoped that we would be in a better place today. Good trouble comes in all colors. Allyship matters. Clearly our nation is in greater need of allies or allyship, which is individuals and groups working together to fight social injustices. We offer a diverse set of speakers throughout the week and you will see examples of this message as we seek to honor the life of MLK. Like all of us during this pandemic, the committee was challenged in developing a completely virtual convocation. I believe Zoom, with all of its challenges, has afforded us an opportunity to reach a much broader audience. So the entire week will be virtual. I want to personally encourage you to review the calendar and join us again throughout the day and again throughout the week. Students, remember, you have an opportunity to earn many Lyceum credits. Finally, I would like to thank, sincerely thank the continuous financial support from our president, Dr. John Wells, who walks the walk who encourages my office to take license, take license with vision and to be bold. Thank you, Dr. Wells. And now I will turn it over to Joan for the introduction of our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Wapi Holloway. Um, it's really my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Daniel Maguire. Uh, Dr. Daniel Maguire is an award-winning historian, public speaker, and also of At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape, and the Resistance, a new history of the civil rights movement from Rosa Parks to the rise of Black power, which won the Frederick Jackson Turner Award and the Leading Smith Book Award. She's a recipient of the Lerner Scott Prize for Best D Dissertation in Women's History. Her journal of um, American history article, it was like we were all raped, sexualized violence, community mobilization, and the African-American freedom struggle. When the A. Elizabeth Taylor Prize for best essay in Southern women's history and was reprinted in the best essays in American history. McGuire is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and has appeared on PBS, CNN, MSNBC, Headline News, National Public Radio, Book TV, and dozens of local television and radio stations throughout the United States. Her popular essays have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Detroit Free Press, Bridge Magazine, Washington Post, Huffington Post, and CNN.com. She serves as a consultant on documentary films such as The Rape of Rusty Taylor and You Belong to Me, The Ruby McCollum Story. She helps curate educational historical tours and civil rights related curricula for secondary schools and serves on the advisory board of History Studio. She's an adjunct associate professor of history at the Wayne State University and is currently at work on a book about police violence in Detroit in 1967. Welcome, Dr. Maguire.
After, um, uh, after a brief song, the next voice you hear will be that of our speaker, Dr. McGuire. Thank you. 
good morning. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And thank you to everyone who worked so hard to bring me to you today. Uh, I can hear someone typing. Is it okay for me to go? All right, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, anyway, thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. But I'm gonna start with something really different. About three years ago, Oprah Winfrey gave an electrifying speech at the Golden Globes Awards. She spoke about the Me Too movement and she praised all of the women who had endured sexual harassment, assault, and terror. Women, she said, like my mother, who had children to feed and bills to pay and dreams to pursue. They are domestic workers, she said, farm workers, women laboring in factories and academia and engineering and medicine and science. They're Olympic athletes, she said, and soldiers in the military. And she said, there's someone else I think you should know, Reese Taylor. Now, this is where she got me. Oh, Carly. Sorry, my slide's not sharing again. Say that one more time. Slide. Is the sound not sharing? Slide is not moving. We we see Oprah. Is that who we're supposed to be seeing? Yeah, but I need to sh I need to switch my slide, and it's not going. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we had a little bit of a glitch this morning with uh, the sharing and um, I've been terrified about this happening, but here we go. Let's hope it works. Um, okay, so Oprah said, there's someone else I think you should know, Reese Taylor. And it, it literally threw me off of the couch while I was watching this because I've known Reese Taylor for many years. Uh, Reese Taylor was someone who I wrote about for my dissertation and for my first book. And I've been honored to know her family for more than a decade. And this is what Oprah Winfrey had to say. There's someone else, Reese Taylor. A name I know and I think you should know too. In 1944, Reese Taylor was a young wife and a mother. She was just walking home from a church service. She'd attended in Abbeville, Alabama when she was abducted by six armed white men, raped and left blindfolded by the side of the road, coming home from church. They threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone. But her story was reported to the NAACP where a young worker by the name of Rosa Parks became the lead investigator on her case. And together they sought justice. But justice wasn't an option in the era of Jim Crow, the men who tried to destroy her were never persecuted. Reese Taylor died 10 days ago, just shy of her 98th birthday. She lived, as we all have lived, too many years in a culture broken by brutally powerful men. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men, but their time is up. Their time is up. So Rosa Parks actually went down to Abbeville, Alabama and met with Reese Taylor. And she brought with her a notebook and a pen and she took Taylor's testimony and the, she carried it back to Montgomery where she and the city's most militant activists organized the Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor. Now, this campaign quickly went nationwide, prompting the largest black newspaper in the nation, the Chicago Defender, to call it the strongest movement for equal justice to be seen in a decade. But there was no justice for Reese Taylor even with national and international pressure to prosecute her assailants, the local grand jury, all white and all male, refused to indict the men who actually admitted 
assaulting her. The Committee for Equal Justice moved on to other cases, other black women uh, throughout the 1940s, and they would become better known as the Montgomery Improvement Association. 11 years later, with Rosa Parks at the helm, this group of homegrown activists would launch a movement, the bus boycott, and a leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that would help to change the world. By then, Recy Taylor was largely forgotten. The only tiny bit of justice she received was in 2011, when the Alabama State Legislature issued a formal apology for the state's, quote, morally abhorrent and repugnant failure to properly prosecute her case. But by introducing Recy Taylor to millions of Americans, Oprah Winfrey did something really important. She signaled Black women's long history of resistance to sexual and racial violence, centering them in a historical narrative that too often makes their experiences invisible. Recy Taylor spoke out decades before white feminists took back the night, made the personal political before anyone said, hashtag me too. Her story is part of a much longer history, both terrifying and inspiring, of black women who have endured public humiliation and risked their lives to lead the charge for freedom. And their testimonies from Harriet Jacobs to Fannie Lou Hamer to Anita Hill to Tarana Burke often serve as catalysts for freedom movements from slavery through the civil rights movement all the way to the present day. So today, I'm gonna to shift our focus away from Dr. King and a more traditional narrative of the civil rights movement to talk about how some cases and the most oft told and illustrious campaigns like the Montgomery bus boycott are actually rooted in a history of gendered political appeals to protect black women from sexual violence. So I was listening to NPR in 1999. I know that's a century ago. It was a show uh, that featured the oral histories of movement veterans. And this particular episode was about the Montgomery bus boycott. And the person speaking was Joe Asbell, who was at the time, the city editor of the Montgomery Advertiser, which was the white newspaper. And this is what he said. Gertrude Perkins is not even mentioned in the history books. It had as much to do with the bus boycott and its creation as anyone on earth. Now, I thought that was really remarkable. Um, I thought I knew something about the bus boycott, and I had never heard of Gertrude Perkins. But she loomed large enough in Joe Asbell's mind for him to remember her 40 years after the boycott when he was interviewed for NPR. And yet most boycott histories fail to mention her name. If your response is anything like mine at the time, you're thinking, okay, well, who's Gertrude Perkins? Well, Gertrude Perkins was a 25-year-old black woman who was abducted and assaulted by two white Montgomery police officers in 1949. This is what her minister, Reverend Solomon Say Sr., had to say about that particular evening. Two policemen had picked you up and taken you down on the railroad and had all types of sex relations with her at that particular time. And when they, when they put her out, she came to my door and she told me what had happened to her. I sat down and wrote what she said had happened to her, word by word. And when she had finished, I had it notarized and sent it to Drew Pearson in Washington. And Drew Pearson went to, to the air with it. And when the power truck you knew uh, and saying here in Montgomery, what Gertrude Perkins said happened to her was all over the nation. Now, after Gertrude Perkins told Reverend Say what happened, they actually went to the police station and reported the crime. Of course, they accused her of lying. The mayor called her claim completely false, and they refused to hold a lineup or issue any warrants. Besides, he said, my policeman wouldn't do a thing like that. 
But African Americans in Montgomery knew better. They knew the history of the police there involved not just racial violence, but also sexist harassment and brutality. And so they quickly formed a committee. And they called it the Citizens Committee for Gertrude Perkins. And they demanded an investigation and a trial. Their public protests lasted for more than two months. In the process, they exposed the longstanding practice of police officers assaulting black women. They forced a grand jury hearing and they brought the city's disparate black ministers together really for the first time. Now this was all very interesting. I still didn't understand what Joe Asbell meant. What did Gertrude Perkins have to do with the bus boycott? After all, her case happened in 1949, six years before the boycott. I still didn't understand what Joe Asbell really meant. And so for a long time, I set Gertrude Perkins' story aside, but I kept it in the back of my mind as I began researching the Montgomery bus boycott. What I found was really interesting. Two years after the Gertrude Perkins case, in February of 1951, a white grocery store owner named Sam Green attacked a black teenager named Flossie Hardman. Now Green employed Flossie as a babysitter and he would often drive her home at the end of her shift. Except one night, he pulled to the side of a quiet road and he attacked her. Hardman told her parents what happened and against all odds, they decided to press charges. And when an all-white jury refused to indict after deliberating for five minutes, the family decided they had to do something else. And so they reached out to community activists like Rufus Lewis, Rosa Parks, members of the NAACP, and the Women's Political Council. Basically, the exact same people who mobilized in defense of Recy Taylor and Gertrude Perkins. And they thought about what they could do. And they realized that Sam Green's grocery store was frequented mostly by African-American buyers. So they thought, well, let's not shop there anymore. And so they launched a boycott of Green's grocery store. After only a couple weeks, African-Americans in Montgomery delivered their own guilty verdict by driving Sam Green into the red. The ability to shut down Sam Green's grocery store was a major victory it established the boycott as a powerful weapon for justice. A couple of years later, Joanne Robinson, who was the militant leader of the Women's Political Council, threatened a mass boycott of the city's buses after scores of black women complained of sexual harassment and racial violence on them. Because besides police officers, Few were as guilty of these crimes as were the city's bus operators who bullied and brutalized black women daily. Bus drivers, we often forget, at the time had police power. They carried guns and blackjacks, and they assaulted and sometimes even killed African Americans who refused to abide by the racial order of Jim Crow. In 1953 alone, African Americans filed over 30 complaints of abuse and mistreatment on the buses. And that might not sound like a lot to us today, but in a world where the Ku Klux Klan operated with impunity, to put your name and your address on a formal complaint was a kind of suicide. So it was a big deal that there were 30 formal complaints. Most of these complaints came from working class black women, mainly domestics, who didn't have cars and had no choice but to ride the buses from the black side of town the white side of town where they worked in white women's kitchens. Now I researched, I researched the bus company's records and testimonies of the riders to figure out, you know, what did they hate about the buses? Most of them complained that bus drivers hurled nasty sexualized insults at them, touched them inappropriately and physically abused them. One woman remembered bus drivers harassing her. She waited on the corner. The bus was up high, she said, and the street was down low. They drive up and expose themselves while I was just standing there, she said. It scared me to death. Another woman remembered that white bus drivers treated black women, quote, just as rough as can be, like we're some kind of animal. Another woman said bus drivers, quote, like to talk under folks' clothes. By 1954, 
the Women's Political Council had heard so many complaints that Joanne Robinson warned the mayor of Montgomery that black women were considering a boycott to keep from being humiliated and insulted. Some women, she told them, were already boycotting the buses. Now this spotty individualized boycott lasted until the spring of 1955 when police arrested Claudette Colvin, a 15 year old high school student for refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger. Colvin didn't expect to be arrested. She said, quote, I thought he would stop and shout and then move on. That's what they usually did. That's an interesting quote. It implies that she had done this before and that, you know, refusing to give up your seat was kind of a, an ordinary occurrence. She said she thought he would stop and shout and move on. But that day, the driver didn't shout and stop and move on. He decided to call the police. And when they arrived, he pointed to Colvin and said, I've had trouble out of that thing before. The policeman ordered Colvin out of the bus, called her a quote, black whore, then beat her, dragged her out and pushed her into the patrol car. Colvin remembered later that she was terrified. She said, quote, you just didn't know what white people might do at that time. I was afraid they might rape me. Think about that for a minute. The fact that Claudette Colvin feared sexual violence for standing up to Jim Crow on a city bus underscored the relationship between racial and sexual violence and highlighted the risks that black women and girls face daily in a segregated South. At her trial in the spring of 1955, a judge dismissed the segregation charge and instead declared Claudette Colvin a juvenile delinquent. Now, local people were furious especially the 300 members of the Women's Political Council who supported Colvin's case and hoped it would become a catalyst for a massive boycott. Joanne Robinson remembered, quote, large numbers of women, she said, who were so angry, they refused to ride the buses. But it wasn't until December 1st, 1955, when police arrested Rosa Parks, that Robinson and the Women's Political Council decided to go for a full-scale bus boycott. Joanne Robinson heard the news and she went home and she scribbled down on an envelope. She scribbled this. The Women's Political Council will not wait for Mrs. Parks' consent to call for a boycott of the city buses. On Friday, December 2nd, the women of Montgomery will call for a boycott to take place on Monday, December the 5th. Robinson quickly drafted a more detailed announcement and she went to Alabama State University where she was a professor. And in the middle of the night, she and two assistants made 52,000 copies of this announcement. They cut them, they bundled them, and they announced the boycott as an effort to protect black women and girls. Here's a clip of that, of that document. It says, another Negro woman has been arrested and thrown in jail because she refused to get up out of her seat on the bus for a white person to sit down. This has to be stopped. If we do not do something to stop these arrests, they will continue. And at the very end, it says, the next time it may be you, your daughter, or your mother. Before breakfast, Robinson then dispatched an army of women to deliver the notices to schools and storefronts, beauty parlors and beer halls, barber shops and businesses. By mid-afternoon, almost everyone in the Black community knew the plan. It's important to put this into context. Ill treatment on the buses denied Black women a sense of dignity and demonstrated they weren't worthy of respect or protection. This belief was part of a long-standing pattern that allowed white men to use and abuse Black women with impunity from slavery through the better part of the 20th century. When we consider this within a spectrum of racial and sexual violence with rape and lynching on one end and the daily indignities of segregation on the other, attacks on black women's bodily integrity on the buses underscored their particular vulnerability in our racial caste system. It was much easier, not to mention safer, to stop riding the buses than it was to bring their assailants, in this case, bus drivers or police officers, to justice. 
Women walked, Rosa Parks said in 1956, not in support of her, but because she said, I was not the only person who had been mistreated and humiliated. Some had gone through similarly shameful experiences, most worse than mine. It was these experiences, not just segregated seating, that propelled the mostly working class black women into every conceivable aspect of the bus boycott. So they were the chief strategists and negotiators of the boycott, and they ran its day-to-day -day operation. They helped staff the elaborate carpool system that kept the boycott working. I like to think of this as the first Uber because it's really what it was. They raised most of the local money for the movement. They filled the majority of the pews at the mass meetings where they testified publicly about physical and sexual abuse on the buses. And because they made up 80% of the city ridership, they were the ones who walked. By walking hundreds of miles for more than a year to protest humiliation, African-American women reclaimed their bodies and demanded the right to be treated with dignity and respect. And even though the bus boycott was rooted in Black women's resistance to both racial and sexual violence, that history is virtually ignored today, despite the fact that it was openly discussed then. For example, when Montgomery police indicted 89 African-Americans in February of 1956 for violating some ancient anti-boycott law, black women stormed the courthouse to protest. From the alleys they came, one man recalled, Black women with bandanas on, wearing men's hats with their dresses rolled up, he said. They stared down the police and refused to move when ordered. When an officer placed one hand on his gun and another on his billy club and insisted that they leave, the fearless women dared him to try it. I don't care what you've got, one woman said. If you hit one of us, you won't leave here alive. Now this public confrontation between black women and white police officers in Montgomery was a long time coming. That night, black women put their bodies on the line in defense of their humanity, something anyone there could see. And yet, the spotlight almost always focused on Dr. King. It's not surprising. He was a brilliant young preacher who had captured the imagination of the whole country. But that spotlight tended to ignore all the women at the center of the bus boycott. For example, the next month at the trial of the 89 arrestees, prosecutors only put Dr. King on the stand and held the other people in abeyance in hopes of ending the boycott by taking out its so-called leader. Instead, prosecutors got an earful from black women who insisted that they also be put on the stand, that they be prosecuted. Time Magazine reported this. It said, quote, after a lifetime of taking it quietly, their emotions welled up and overflowed in their testimony. Almost all of the women there that day testified that they stopped riding the buses because the drivers abused them and treated them cruelly again and again and again. City prosecutors only wanted to punish Dr. King, but the women set him straight. Wasn't no one man who started it, Gladys Moore said. We started it. We started it overnight. And Stella Brooks told the judge she hadn't been on a bus since August 12th, 1950, the day a policeman shot and killed her husband for arguing with the bus driver. Martha Walker stopped riding because drivers, she said, constantly heaped abuse upon her blind husband, a World War II veteran. Bus drivers Henrietta Brimson said, just don't want to treat us the right way. By detailing one experience after another, Black women denounced the system that stole their dignity on a daily basis. But like the prosecutors and the judge, Reporters at the trial ignored the black women's testimonies. Instead, the media turned King into a martyr for civil rights. Jet Magazine actually called him Alabama's modern Moses. And local ministers presented King to a mass meeting after the trial as the man who was nailed to the cross for you and me. 
From that day forward, Rosa Parks, the radical activist and anti-rape uh, advocate who rode down to Abbeville to take Recy Taylor's testimony in 1944, that Rosa Parks was written out of history. So were Joanne Robinson and her army of women in the Women's Political Council. And so were the thousands of working class black women who made Montgomery the walking city. They were all reduced to the footnotes of history. And while the media is partly to blame for this you know, imagery of Dr. King and for ignoring the real reasons and real leaders of the bus boycott, other civil rights organizations in an effort to use Montgomery's success to spark movements elsewhere, recast the bus boycott as a movement led by men. So shortly after the boycott ended, a Northern civil rights organization called the Fellowship of Reconciliation published a comic book that cast Dr. King as a fearless and experienced organizer who led his people out of bondage. In Ford's version, King and his cavalry of men come to the rescue of Rosa Parks, who refused to move from her seat because, and you can see here in this frame, she was tired and her feet ached. The cartoon features a nervous King, worried sick about Parks' arrest, who stayed up all night planning a response. Something's gotta be done, he says. Rosa's a good woman and not a troublemaker. They had no right arresting her. A helpless Coretta in the background says, but what can we do? Don't worry, King has a plan. Here he is as an organizer standing in front of a room full of men uh, demanding a public response. We ought to protest, he said, and not ride the buses for a day. In the next frame, King stands over a mimeograph machine with his shirt sleeves rolled up. He and another man run off a few hundred copies of the announcement calling for a one day boycott. And the rest, as they say, is history. Unfortunately, this version of events obscures the real history of the protest as a women's movement for dignity and bodily integrity. The focus on King was so absolute that even today, many historians overlook the fact that it was four female plaintiffs, Claudette Colvin, Mary Louise Smith, Mrs. Aurelia Browder, and Mrs. Susie McDonald, who had been arrested and mistreated on the buses, who were the ones who filed the lawsuit that expanded the reach of and put teeth into the 1954 Brown decision. In fact, because it was a transportation case, Browder v. Gale ultimately signaled the death knell of the separate but equal doctrine uh, that was part of the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson case. But it also signaled African-Americans full arrival in Montgomery as citizens worthy of respect and recognition. And so the bus boycott was never just about integration or sitting at the front of the bus. It was about what Dr. King would later call the thingification of white supremacy. And while it's often portrayed as a spontaneous, you know, Rosa Parks' feet ached and so she just made that decision, or primarily male-led movement, the Montgomery bus boycott had a past. It was rooted in the struggle to protect and defend black women from racial and sexual violence. And it's impossible for us to understand and situate the boycott in its proper historical context without knowing the stories of Reese Taylor and Gertrude Perkins and Flossie Hardman and all of the others who were mistreated in and around Montgomery and those who rallied to their defense. In fact, without those stories, it's impossible to understand why, why thousands of black women put their bodies on the line to protest mistreatment on the buses. Now, you may be wondering why I focused on Rosa Parks and black women instead of Dr. King on Martin Luther King Day. After all, it was in Montgomery where Dr. King was only 26 at the time, it's hard to believe, went from just the new guy in town to a national spokesperson for a mass movement that would fundamentally change the world. But I wanted to show you how, if we use a different lens, in this case, gender and sexual violence, we can see the freedom movement in a different light. 
And in seeing it with new eyes, we can take away some lessons to help us make change today. So one, we can see how well before Dr. King arrived, there was already a core group of radical activists who had launched very successful campaigns. Rosa Parks was in fact, one of the most militant activists in Alabama uh, throughout the 1940s and 1950s. When Dr. King arrived in 1955, he found the folks who were already active and he tapped into their networks. As the brilliant activist Ella Baker put it later, the movement made Dr. King. He didn't make the movement. Now that's not to say he wasn't important. He was, absolutely. His true contribution wasn't as a modern day Moses though, as Jet put it. It was as a formidable organizer of people and a proponent of a philosophy, nonviolence, nonviolence direct action or what he would call massive militant nonviolence, a philosophy that is as powerful today as it was then. To single him out as a sole leader is to betray the greatness of his radical vision to remake America, a vision that included ordinary people leading movements in their own community. And we need that Dr. King now more than ever. Two, in that same vein, by shifting the focus to the thousands of women who refuse to ride the buses, we can see how ordinary people can make extraordinary change. Rosa Parks and Dr. King didn't bring down Jim Crow by themselves. Movements take masses and every single person as something important to contribute. Three, centering black women also shows us that the civil rights struggle wasn't just about where you sat on the bus or about equal access to public accommodation. It was about being able to move through the world without being molested or assaulted. And really, what does freedom mean if not that? Four, shifting the focus away from King and towards the women also highlights how black women's leadership was central to the freedom struggle. That was true in Montgomery, as well as Birmingham, Selma, Mississippi, South Carolina, you name it. It was true then, and it's just as true today. And just as black women's central roles in the civil rights movement are too often diminished or disappeared from our public narratives of the past, their leadership today is still too often ignored and made invisible. Finally, by focusing on the stories of Recy Taylor, Gertrude Perkins, and Flossie Hardman, I wanted to signal their importance in history, and I wanted to say their names. And in saying their names, I wanted to show how scholar Ed Pavlik, a friend of mine, put it recently, the history of race is the history of sex. The history of racial violence is the history of sexual violence. And the future of racial liberation depends upon the future of bodily integrity. We stand at the confluence of these movements. We live in the catastrophe of our history. And if we are to understand and honestly confront our past, if we want to provide what historian Nell Painter calls a fully loaded cost accounting, of white supremacy and patriarchy, and if we wanna make sure the most vulnerable among us are given the same attention, dignity, and support as the most privileged and powerful, then we must include analyses of these intersectional moments of sexual and racial, racial violence, of testimony and protest that remain at the volatile core of the civil rights movement and what it means to be truly free today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. So we're gonna open up now for Q and A. Um, there's two ways that you can ask a question. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can absolutely do that, or you can put it in the chat and I will ask it for you. Either way, it's just fine.
Well, I'll jump in if no one else is. Uh, Dr. McGuire, I, as you were speaking, especially in the last part of your talk, uh, one of the things that I thought about was um, the ways in which history is often told as uh, uh, individual great men, usually, um, and uh, or individual great person. And to me, one of the more current examples of this is after the results of the presidential election in Georgia and then the Senate runoff in Georgia, you saw all sorts of stuff on social media celebrating Stacey Abrams, rightly so. But um, I recall more than once where she would post something about, you know, it's not, I mean, she didn't say it in these words. It's not just me. There's all these other folks. And you talked about ordinary people. Uh, John Dittmer's history of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement is called Local People. So I, I'm interested in, in just your talking a little more about that. Why is it that we seem to want to focus on just one person, often a man, but uh, we, 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 what, what's, uh, what's going on there? Well, since this is the age of conspiracies, um, the conspiracist in me thinks it's a way to depoliticize movements, to de-radicalize them, and to lead people to believe that they need, you know, these powerful leaders who um, are the only ones who can help us make change. And so it takes the onus off individuals to, you know, be part of a community, part of an effort to, you know, make the world a better place, even in their neighborhoods and puts it on some mystical, magical, singular entity to do all the work for us. Um, I, I, and I think, it's, I think it's just simplistic. Um, you know, if you think about the way we write textbooks, you know, you have a few hundred words you can use and so you go to the most important person, but it's also part of our history, the way the news media framed King and framed the movement, they often, um, singled him out. And that was part of the gender and racial politics of the time as well. Um, and it is today in lots of ways. Um, but I think that's just how we've been conditioned to think change happens, that change happens by leaders and people follow leaders. When the reality is, when we study the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the voting rights campaigns, it's about ordinary people working, doing what Ella Baker called the spade work of organizing the everyday mundane boring awful you know non-celebrated tasks that make change possible so if you think about what happened in georgia that took hundreds of thousands of phone calls of door knocking of petitioning of talking of conversations and stacy abrams could have done that herself i mean you know hardly anybody is persuaded by a talking head um well anybody uh, but but uh but it takes real work and i think you know her you know that is a great example of how probably our media and our um, desire to you know package a story um gets sold again and again and again and the more important part of that story is the ordinary people doing the daily work to make change possible Thanks. Dr. McGuire, we do have a question from the chat. How do we make the connection with these black women and King without taking away from King's legacy? Well, why isn't there room for both and, right? Um, it, understanding King is understanding that he had a powerful message he advocated a powerful full philosophy that he devoted his life to, that he convinced other people to devote their lives to. Um, and studying him is important. And it's, you know, talking about how movements are made, it's not to diminish him at all. It's to actually, I think, raise him up and understand his role um, and understand the power that he had to help people believe in themselves. You know, Dr. King didn't, uh, you know, give speeches and say, I alone can change you know, the law. He said, we're all in it together. 
he promoted this idea of moving from an I to a we kind of movement. Instead of being an individual stuck and locked in struggle, uh, who faces these burdens alone, you move it to the community. And together the community can both share the pain of the past and the hope for the future. So if we listen to Dr. King, that's what he's talking about. So in some ways, you know, expanding our understanding of him, uh, decentering him just a little bit, at least the version of him that's told publicly is really important way to understand him better to understand him as an organizer and not just as a, a, a dreamer or a speech maker. Another question from the chat. What first inspired you to pursue this kind of research? And what from this presentation do you hope best sticks with the viewers as we go about our day-to-day -day lives? Hmm. So what inspired me to do this research? Uh, so I'm from Janesville, Wisconsin, uh, a mostly predominantly white town. Um, and I didn't have any understanding of race or race relations or anything at all. I believed that America was the greatest country in the world and that everyone was equal because that's what I was told. And I read this book in high school um, called Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozel. It's about school segregation and school inequality. And it, really blew my mind. Um, I couldn't believe it was true because it went against everything I had been told and everything that I had experienced as a poor white girl in Wisconsin, I still had access to opportunity because I went to a good public school and was surrounded by people who believed I could be somebody. Um, this book told me that there were all kinds of places and all kinds of people who didn't have that same experience who were as poor as I was. And so I wanted to see if it was true in a community close to mine. And so I went to Milwaukee uh, where my father lived actually. And I visited a public school there, Milwaukee South Division. And I tested this hypothesis it is what Jonathan Kozel said in his book, True About Milwaukee. And lo and behold, it was, <laughs> and it blew me away. Um, it was the first time I had been in a school where I was the only white person I became suddenly aware of my own race, my own place. Um, the school was fundamentally behind where we were, um, even though I felt like we were all the same class. Um, it, it challenged everything I thought I knew about the country and about my place in it. And I decided I wanted to learn more. And so that's what I did. And, and that's what brought me to the study of the civil rights movement. I like the idea of um, David versus Goliath. I like the idea that ordinary people are um, capable of extraordinary change. And so if you take anything away from this talk today, I hope you take um, a few things. One, that you know there are lots of people out there already working for change and for civil rights. And so you don't have to create the wheel, right? You can join one of these organizations and, and join the people who are already doing the work. Um, and two, uh, never underestimate the power you have as a citizen to um, have a voice and to make change in your community. That's one of the primary lessons of the civil rights movement that both Dr. King and Rosa Parks and the women in Montgomery would have you know. Dr. McGuire, this is Sharon Bowers. If we agree that uh, black women have always been at the forefront of anti-racism activism, um, how do we deal with intersectionality and the continual dismissal of their actions and men being placed in the forefront instead? It is very hard. And you see this attempt again and again and again. I mean, we have a movement for black lives and yet we still have to, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw has to still put forward a say her name campaign because the focus is almost always on violence done to men. And so black women not only have to you know, they're not only leading the movements, like if we look at Black Lives Matter movement, not only are Black women at the center of that, the leadership of that, but then they also have to start a new movement to focus attention on Black women who are targeted by police violence and other kinds of violence. And so um, we need people to understand that until the most vulnerable among us are, our 
are protected and treated with the same dignity, respect, and protection as the most privileged, and I'm, I'm talking mostly to white women now, um, unless white women get involved in that, I think we're still going to have these fractures um, where black women have to both lead and fight to make their leadership visible. Um, we need a chorus, not a soloist here. Um, and understanding our history, understanding black women's central role in almost every freedom movement this country has ever seen, uh, I think can help us get behind those black women as leaders, support them, fight with them, and move together towards a more just and free future. Another question from the chat. How do we effectively educate America about the horrors that black women faced uh, then and now in the North and the South? Well, we have a lot of work to do in general. Um, and, and to me, you know, focusing our attention on black women and other women of color affords us an opportunity to get the whole of American history. Um, when we leave them out, we get a fractured version of our past, a, a little piece of a mirror that doesn't reflect our reality in the present um, and doesn't honestly reflect the reality of the past. And so when you center black women in the history, when you center women of color in the history and you center them in the present, um, we can move towards a better understanding of our past and a better understanding of our present. But until we do that, we're in some ways short-sighted, right? Um, and so I think we need to just do the work, right? How do we do this? We do it by doing the work. And we do it by demanding that the institutions where we learn and the sources where we get information from center that history and those women in the narrative. We can ask that of our teachers, of our professors, of our media, et cetera. We can force that, we can. This is a big question and a very important one. How do we get white women to see their complicity in oppression? <sighs> well, one of the ways is by learning about the history of white supremacy. And that requires individual effort. You know, white women don't need black women to tell them about their struggles for white women to understand racial violence, the history of racism, right? White women can do that work themselves and they need to. Um, they need to be their own teachers here. And there are ample resources to do that work. So there's no excuse at all for not understanding or at least trying to understand our history. Um, now more than ever, there's podcasts, you know, books, videos, movies. There's so many ways to understand um, our history and our role in it. White women have for too long um, used their position and proclaimed their innocence in order to maintain their position of power and authority, even in a patriarchal society that diminishes us as well as women of color. Um, we need to band together in order to get free, all of us. Um, but the point isn't to learn about this in order to feel guilty or to wallow in that like, oh, I'm part of this horrible history because guilt really, it does nothing for um, motivation. You know, if you're guilty about something, you usually don't say, well, I'm gonna change that. You just hide from it, you bury it, you move on, you shroud it in shame, right? Um, and that's not the thing to do. The thing to do is to say, huh, I'm part of a system that gives me power and privilege and I haven't really earned it. Uh, I'm part of that system because of the color of my skin or the class status that I was born into or that I, you know, climbed into. 
um, and I can use my power and privilege to help others as well. I don't have to feel guilty about it. What I need to do is understand it and then work to transform it. So I always think of white supremacy in some ways as like gray hairs. And I have a lot of them these days. Um, and if I see a gray hair, I pluck it out. I'm like, oh my God, there's a gray hair. It's like white supremacy. I will do something and I'll think, oh my gosh, where did I get that idea from? Where did, I, where did that bias creep into my mindset? Why did I feel afraid when I saw a group of black men over there? What is that? That's white supremacy. That is the world that we're swimming in. And like fish don't always know that they're wet. We don't always know that we're breathing in and absorbing ideas of racial superiority and inferiority. And it's okay to say, holy cow, I'm prejudiced and I have bias. And then you say, okay, what do I do about it? Well, let me work to get that out of my system. Let me work to see where that came from. Let me work to understand why I feel that way and understand that that's what it is. It's a bias, it's a prejudice. We learn these things and we can unlearn them. So whatever I, whenever I talk to white people, I just try to get them to understand that, that guilt isn't a, a useful emotion and neither is shame. What's important is acknowledgement, education, and then action. And that's something we can all do and we can feel proud of that. And, and I'll tell you what, when you do the work and you try, my experience has been that people of color see that and they recognize it and they will help you and stand by your side in, in, in that journey. Thank you. I believe I'm caught up in the chat, so I don't know if anyone else would like to unmute themselves and ask a question or add one to the chat. Oh, one just came through. For students interested in history, what do you recommend as steps to move forward in this movement? Read the books, read the syllabus, as your professor would say. Um, I, I included a list of uh, my favorite books, and you can see that in the college's announcement of this event, and that's a great place to start. But, but really, you've got to do the work. You've got to understand the past. You have to work to understand what's happening in the present. And, and you have to um, be committed to that. And that doesn't mean you're committed to it every single day. Um, it means that you devote a part of your day, a part of your life to being the change you want to see, right? Um, but, but reading is always a good start. And like I said, there's a gazillion podcasts. There's a gazillion magazine articles. There's a gazillion documentaries. You know, if you don't like to read books and you just like watching movies, start with Eyes in the Prize, right? There's a, it's a fantastic older series that still holds up. It's fantastic. Um, start with that. There's a ton of shows on television right now. The New York Times just listed like, here's the 10 things to watch on Martin Luther King Day. Start there. Um, and then start doing some, you know, deeper dives into the history and into the present. A really great article that came out a couple years ago uh, with ta Coates' Coates's um, the call for reparations about housing in Chicago. It's a great article. It covers a lot of history. It's really easy to read. It's a good place to start. Thank you. Um, Someone asked a question about, I guess, some of the historical context. Um, at Sam's Grocery that you mentioned and other businesses in Montgomery, where whites were allowed, were, like, were whites allowed to visit African-American businesses? Did some businesses decide to integrate and allow white and blacks in the same, oh, hold on, in the same store? Um, well, the, the interesting thing about segregation is that a lot of it, there was always integration. It was just unequal. So black people could go into the shoe store, for example, they just couldn't try on the shoes. Uh, they could go to the local restaurant, but they had to get takeout from the back door. Um, and white people could go into black businesses. Um, there wasn't that same kind of, you know, inferior, superior uh, quality to it, but most white people probably didn't. Um, because of their own sense of superiority, right? Um, but integration was a lot more common 
especially what civil rights leaders sometimes called nighttime integration, um, then people will admit. But like I said, it wasn't an equal integration. There wasn't equality in that. There was a power imbalance. But I will also say black people have never done to white people what white people have done to black people. And, and, and it's interesting to me that there's always this fear that if you commit fully to equality that, that white people will sort of have it coming. Um, and that to me is white people's own guilt about their own complicity in this history uh, and in this systematic and structural racism of our society. But it's never been the case. We have time for a few more questions before we um, transition. So, uh, does anyone have an additional question for the chat or would they like to unmute themselves and ask? Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm a friend of Danielle's and um, she's going to recognize this question. And so you, you've done some tremendous research in terms of of a number of areas, but you did something on the Algiers Motel in Detroit, in which uh, three uh, police officers killed, um, or a number of police officers killed three young black men. Has this, how does this impact what you're doing? And can we educate uh, not only America, but the world to the inequality and the things that law enforcement officers have done to continue to uh, perpetuate these kinds of thoughts and ideas of uh, lack of black humanity? Great question. And before anybody thinks that this is some radical liberal uh, hippie on the phone here, this is uh, the former police chief of Detroit, uh, Dr. Ike McKinnon. <laughs> okay. Who, who is African-American who has had his own experiences with police violence as a police officer coming up in Detroit in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so this question from Dr. McKinnon comes out of a place of deep understanding of both uh, police violence and racial discrimination and, and uh, bias in police departments. Um, and so, I, you know, I would defer to you, Dr. McKinnon, but, <laughs> <laughs> as, as I so often do, but, but he's right. I mean, I, I'm writing a book right now about the murder of three African-American teenagers by a group of white policemen in Detroit in the middle of the 1967 uprising. And uh, I've gotten the FBI files, the police department records, uh, you know, you name it, interviews with all of the um, victims, their families, and interviews with the assailants themselves. And what I found is that uh, is, is, a, is an infrastructure of structural and systematic racism, not just in the Detroit Police Department in the 1960s, but in the judges uh, in Detroit, in the lawyers, in the juries, in the legislature, and so it's so important to see this infrastructure of systemic and structural racism in the North because we so often put the blame for segregation and racial injustice on the South. And the truth is it was as virulent and as violent and as um, difficult to crack in the North, maybe even more so than it was in the South. Um, and when you go through the records and you see the lies and the cover up and, and you know the actual transcript of these things, uh, there's no question that this you know police violence has a long history and that there's a history of working to protect bad cops who do bad things from any kind of punishment. The reason why there's still so much impunity by police officers today for their violence is because they have never been held accountable uh, for decades and decades of what they've done in the past. We 
We have one more question in the chat here. How have you been received by black women and black people as you study their history and herstory? How do you navigate this terrain? Well, you know, the truth is that this is our history as Americans um, and we need to understand it. And white people have a very large role in the history of white supremacy, I mean, the role, right? So in order to understand American history, we need to understand black history. It is the history of America. In fact, when you leave black people out of the history, you have a very incomplete narrative of the American past. Um, how have I been received? Very well, mostly with open arms. Um, you know, I've worked alongside a lot of older African Americans to help tell their stories like Greasy Taylor and her family. I just talked to her brother two days ago, in fact. Um, I'm in touch with almost all the women that I wrote about who worked with me and helped me um, lift their voices up so that they could, you know, um, be recognized for uh, what they did in the past and the role that their testimonies play in the present. Um, there are some people who don't think white people should be doing black history or shouldn't be telling those narratives. And that's okay. That's rooted in a very real history of racial exploitation. Um, and I understand that. Um, but my experience has been that when you are true to yourself and you do the work and you do it consistently and honestly and with integrity that there are very few barriers um, because we're working for the same thing. Thank you so much, Dr. McGuire. Um, right now, we're going to go ahead and pause to transition into faculty connections. So we'll take a little break here, um, allow everyone to go get a drink of water and come back. Students, if you will, go ahead and grab yourself some lunch.